In the beginning, there were three cosmic dragons. And within the vast emptiness of the cosmos, they set to work. Together they created the Astral Realm, and within it, thirteen planes of existence. With their work complete, they marveled at their creation. But even cosmic dragons can be tempted by the vice of avarice. The dragon called Kaiba wished for all of creation to belong to her, and without warning she struck. She slayed her brother Sibiris and shattered his body. Enraged, the dragon called Eberron retaliated against Kaiba, and for an age they fought. They fought to a stalemate. Eberron and Kaiba were evenly matched, but Eberron had one final trump card to play. She sacrificed her own body and imprisoned Kaiba within herself. And thus, the material plane was born. Eberron became the world, and within the world, Kaiba became the dragon below. The great Underdark, where evil festers and pours forth to the surface. While up above, the shattered body of Sibiris became a great ring of crystal surrounding the planet, known as the Dragon Above. Almost all cultures of Eberron consider the tale of the progenitor dragons as the genesis of the world. Some consider it metaphorical, while some consider it quite literal. Whether or not the tale is true is left to mystery, as there is no documented history of such events. What followed the genesis of Eberron were many ages of turmoil. The first being the Age of Demons. 100,000 years before present-day Eberron, the first of Kaiba's evil denizens surged forth onto the world. Thirty archfiends commanding a horde of demons invaded the surface world and took it for themselves. But Eberron was not defenseless. A great flight of dragons allied themselves with the Coatl, celestial beings said to be made of Sibiris' essence. Together, they fought against the demons led by nine champions. Whether the champions were dragons, Coatl, or simply just gods is still debated to this day. It is said that during this battle, there were also six betrayers who turned against the dragons, who became known as the Dark Six. Regardless of what they actually were, this is one of the origin stories of the sovereign host and Dark Six, told by many cultures of Eberron. The dragons realized that the Archfiends could not be destroyed, as they would simply regenerate within Kaiba and return. So the Coatls sacrificed themselves, gave up their bodies to create a celestial force known as the Silver Flame. With the power of the Silver Flame, the dragons were able to bind the Archfiends within great purple crystals known as Kaiba Dragon Shards. The shards were then scattered and hidden away, bringing the Age of Demons to an end. To this day, although the Archfiends still remain sealed away and hidden, they still exert their influence on the world. A cabal of their demon followers, known as the Lords of Dust, seek to free their masters, whilst the secret society of dragons, known as the Chamber, work to stop them. These two groups are fighting a shadow war in present-day Eberron, using the mortal races like pawns in a game, to manipulate what is called the Draconic Prophecy, a great mystical force that dictates the fate of the world. The Lords of Dust believe that if they can subvert the Draconic Prophecy enough, their Archfiend Overlords will be able to break free from containment, to terrorize the world once more. What followed in the period 80,000 to 40,000 years before present day came the Age of Giants. With the demons now contained, the dragons took the mantle of responsibility for the world and began teaching the ways of arcane magic to mortal races. Among those taught were the giants of the continent of Gendrik. The dragons soon realized that one of the imprisoned archfiends, known as the Daughter of Kaiba, was able to influence them as they continued to exercise their arcane power. The more they used their powers, the more she was able to influence them to the point of being able to corrupt their minds. In response, the dragons collectively left and gathered on the continent of Arganesson, the resting place of the dragon shard containing the daughter of Kaiba, 
and they still remain there to this present day. In the dragon's absence, the giants of Zhendrik grew powerful, harnessing the arcane magics that the dragons had taught them. Consumed by power, the giants became cruel and enslaved another of Zhendrik's early races, the elves. To keep the elves in line, they used their magic to create the drow, the dark elves of Eberron, that could serve as the giants' living weapons against other elves. A faction of giants, known as the Kul Sur, grew ambitious to the point that they even wanted to dominate over other planes of existence, and this brought them into contact with the denizens of the dream plane of Dal Kor, known as the Kori. It is unknown which side struck first, but a war erupted between the giants and the Kori, who began pouring into the material plane through various portals and manifest zones. To stop the Kori from overrunning them, the giants resorted to using cataclysmic magic to destroy one of Eberron's moons. This act of destruction destabilized Dalkor's position in the astral realm and flung it far away from the material plane. The Kori and other denizens of Dalkor now had no direct access to Eberron, effectively ending the war. To the present day, the only way the Kori have been able to influence the material plane is by occupying the mind of a human, resulting in the race known as the Kalashtar and their sworn enemies, the Inspired. In the aftermath of the war against the Kori, the giants were left destabilized and the elves seized this opportunity to rebel against them. The giants were cornered and once again prepared to use their cataclysmic magics against the elves just as they did against the Kori. However, their wanton destruction of Eberron's moon did not go unnoticed by others. The dragons emerged from Argonessen, using their full power to not only devastate the giants, but also placing draconic curses upon the land of Zhendrik. These curses scoured the land and ensured that no future civilization could grow upon Zhendrik and harness the magical artifacts that the giants left behind. In present-day Eberron, Zhendrik is a dangerous land that draws many adventurers, scholars, and researchers in the hopes of recovering some of the giants' former power. Following the destruction of the giants came the period from 40,000 to 5,000 years before present day, the Age of Monsters. The dragons returned to Arganesson, and the elves, now free of the giants, migrated to the continent of Aranel, where their civilization flourished around a concept of life and death in harmony, known as the Undying Court. On the continent of Sarlona, the human race was flourishing and spreading, and on the continent of Corvair, several races were coming to prominence. The first gnomes and halflings appeared, dwarves arrived on the continent having migrated underground from the frozen north continent of Frostfell. The first elven settlers from Aranel arrived in the southeast and became known as the Tanadal, and the Dragonborn appeared among the jungles and mountains of what will eventually become known as Kabara. However, the dominant force of this age would be the goblins, hobgoblins, and bugbears. At first, the goblinoids were too busy fighting each other for territory, which prevented them from growing. But around 16,000 years ago, it is said that one of their spiritual leaders named Jazal Dakan gathered the six goblinoid kings together and united their people by creating a dream that all goblinoids would share. Through this dream, the goblinoids came together with one purpose and the Dakani Empire was born. For 10,000 years, the empire dominated the continent of Corvair. No other race could match their military might or their feats of artifice. They constructed great cities throughout the land and drove the other races to the edge of the continent. However, deep within Eberron, the evil of Kaiba stirred once again. From the plain of Joriat, the beings called the Dalkir arrived on Eberron, rising up through Kaiba's many manifest zones and portals to assault the Dakani. They led great armies of aberrations such as Illithids, Beholders, and Aboleths, and they struck without warning. The aberrant forces raised many Dakani cities to the ground, the Dalkir using captured goblinoids, mutating and twisting them into aberrations and turning them against their former allies. But it was not enough to stand against the might of the Dakani Empire, 
and as the aberrations were driven back and destroyed, a group of orc druids, known as the Gatekeepers, used their primal magic to seal the Dalkir deep within Kaiba. Victory seemed certain, but the Dalkir had one final card to play before defeat. One of the Dalkir, named Dirn the Corrupter, unleashed a psychic contagion which spread rapidly through the Goblinoid Empire. The contagion caused the Dakani to be cut off from their shared dream, giving way to their more natural and erratic nature. And slowly, but surely, their empire fell into ruin. Some of the Dakani sealed themselves away in vaults beneath the earth to await a time when the dream would unite them once again. The goblins, hobgoblins and bugbears that remained on the surface would fracture, adopting many different beliefs and societal structures and Corvair was once again a land without rule. Following the decline of the Dakani Empire, the next 5,000 years leading to present day are simply known as the Modern Age, the Age of Man, or the Age of the Mark, depending on who you ask. Humans from Sarlona had set their sights on Corvair and began migrating over, with the first migrants led by an adventurer named Lazar, settling on the eastern coast and isles. Further humans began settling the north and southern coastline, as the arriving humans discovered great ruined cities populated by fairly savage goblinoids. They simply assumed that other humans had been there before them and constructed the cities, and in some cases began building their own cities on top of the Dakani ruins, eventually realizing the truth of the goblinoids past. During this time, the first dragon marks began appearing across the various races of the world. Dragon marks are physical manifestations of the draconic prophecy, resembling an intricate, colored birthmark that usually manifests itself around adolescence. A dragon marked individual is empowered with certain magical talents depending on what mark they have manifested. People with each type of mark would eventually gather together and form a house with these dragon marked houses eventually becoming an economic force in the world as they use their magical talents to provide goods and services in exchange for money. Through the modern age, 13 different dragon marks would appear. On occasion, an individual could manifest an aberrant dragon mark, a mark that belongs to none of the houses and would usually cause the bearer to manifest dangerous and chaotic magic powers. Those who manifested an aberrant dragon mark were feared and eventually were persecuted against and hunted. Humans rapidly expanded across Corvair, driving the goblinoids into the wilds and depressing the other races. Five city-states were established, Descara, Thaliost, Korth, Metral, and Rote. In the south, King Bregor of Rote lays waste to the city of Sharat and then resettles it, founding the present-day metropolis of Shan. 2,000 years before the present day, a human warlord named Khan the Conqueror led an army down from the north and seizes the city of Korth, declaring the surrounding lands the nation of Karnath. He then led a campaign of bloodshed to attempt to capture the other four city-states, but his cruelty and malice would prove to be his undoing. As the four city-states united against him, he was defeated and returned to Karnath, where his bloodline would continue to rule for the next thousand years. Meanwhile, in Sarlona, a time known as the Sundering began. Although the Kori no longer had direct access to the material plane, they used dreams to manipulate the minds of Sarlonan men, forming dark deals with them to bond with their minds. These bonded men would become known as the Inspired. Using the Inspired, the Kori caused wars and unrest across the land, forcing a great many refugees to cross the ocean and settle on the west coast of Corvair, in the Shadow Marches and Demon Wastes. 1,000 years before the present, a descendant of Khan the Conqueror named Galifar Wanan set out to do what his ancestor failed and led a campaign to unite the five human nations under one banner. Unlike Khan, Galifar uses both force and diplomacy, and after 14 years of campaigning, he unites the five nations under his rule. This date would mark the first year of the kingdom, or 1YK, the beginning of Corvair's calendar.
Galifar appoints his five oldest children as governors of the provinces of the kingdom, renaming the other four city-states after them, Ander, Thrain, Breland, and Sire. When Galifar eventually passed away, his oldest daughter Sire inherited the crown, with her siblings serving as regents of the other nations until her own children were old enough to rule. And the line of succession would continue this way for 894 years. Thanks to the advances in technology and magical convenience provided by the dragon-marked houses, Corvair flourishes during this time. In the year 298YK, one of the demon lords named Belshalor would partially break free of his containment and his forces would proceed to terrorize the nation of Thrain. Harnessing the power of the silver flame created by the dragon so long ago during the Age of Demons, a paladin named Tira Moron sacrifices herself to rebind Belshalor and restore peace to Thrain. The Church of the Silver Flame is then founded and adopted by Thrain as the national religion. This period of peace and prosperity came to an end with the passing of King Jarrett, ruler of all Corvair in the year 894 YK. The succession of his rightful heir Mishan is rejected by three of her four siblings. What followed was a century of war which would become known as the Last War. The five nations waged a relentless war against each other with the conflict fueled by the dragon-marked houses providing support to all sides, particularly the weapons created by the artifices of House Kanath. During this time, House Kanath created the Warforged, living sentient constructs that were created for war and required no sleep, food, or air. The perfect soldiers. The war raged for a hundred years, until one day, without warning, the nation of Sire was completely and utterly destroyed. Engulfed in a strange surging mist that persists to this day, every living thing caught inside was either killed or warped beyond recognition by the strange magical energy spread by the mist. This day of destruction would eventually become known as the Morning, with the nation of Sire often referred to afterwards as the Mornlands. Unsure of who was responsible, and terrified that the same fate awaited them, the remaining four nations declared a ceasefire. Leaders from all over Corvair met and established the Treaty of Thronehold, which not only split the four remaining nations of Galifar, but also recognized several other lands as sovereign nations. These lands included the Talenta Plains, homeland of the Halflings, Zalago, homeland of the Gnomes, Kabara, the jungle frontier, the Lazar Principalities, land of the Pirate Lords, the Maror Holds, realm of the dwarves that once belonged to Karnath, the Eldeen Reaches, populated by farmers that seceded from Andair during the war, and Dargoon and Valinar, which were seized from Sire during the war by goblinoids and elves respectively. In addition to this, House Karnath were ordered to cease production of the Warforged and destroy any remaining creation forges which produced them. The Treaty of Thronehold was signed in the year 996YK. Two years have passed since, and 998YK is the default starting point for an Eberron campaign. The future of Eberron is up to you, adventurer. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to like and subscribe below because there will be more Eberron Historian videos coming in the future and I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Let me know what part of Eberron you would like me to take a deep dive into and if you would like to support my channel please check out my Patreon, there is a link below where not only can you support the future production of Eberron Historian videos but you can pick up a free monthly battle map and paying patrons will also score the music and ambience that I've written to go along with it such as the map shown here, the Shadow Marches Bayou and the accompanying music and ambience. I also have a Twitch channel, link below, where we play live D&D on Monday and Friday nights. And of course, don't forget to check out Exploring Eberron by Keith Baker, available from dmsguild.com. That's all for me. I'll see you next time. Happy rolling.